Greetings to you this morning on this beautiful, uh, it's going to be another steamy day here in Wolfboro, but it's a lovely morning and cool inside and just great to have you with us. I'm Reverend Nancy Talbot. I am the former pastor of the Congregational Church of North Barnstead down off of Route 28 in Barnstead. And uh, I was there for 12 years. I, before that, I was in Dover for five years. Before that, I was here as the uh, for a short term, 18 month term of being of your, I was your minister of Christian nurture uh, while I was finishing seminary. And when I left here, I was called to Dover and then tracked back here. So I've sort of come home in some ways, although the church is quite different than it was when I was here uh, 20 years ago. A lot more, a lot more light coming in, isn't there? So I'm glad to be here with you today as I cover for Donna, who's taking a well deserved break and vacation. Uh, there are announcements in the bulletin, and you have those there for your perusal. You can read them during the sermon, after the sermon, you know, whenever, whenever you feel that it's a good time. And uh, anybody else have any comments? Andy has a comment. I, I just have an announcement. It's lovely to have Julie Carbone here playing oboe with us today. Yay. I heard her practice, it's gonna be wonderful. So let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Please join me. Please join me in the call to worship. Into this place we come, bringing our fears, our doubts, and the questions of our hearts. We come, come to hear from the one that drives away our despair. Into this place we come with our wondering, our imagining, and our seeking. We, we come, come to discover the one who searches for us. Into this place of openness, we come knocking, hoping, and longing. We come to be embraced by the one whose heart is never locked. Our first hymn is Sweet Hour Prayer, found in the Red Hymnal, page 505. join in the unison prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, the morning breeze whispers your holy name. The trees clap their hands in time to create. You build your community in our midst despite our best efforts to tear it down. Through the streets of fear and failure, you walk with us giving us words when our lives turn us speechless. 
Your mercy flows through us, cleansing what we cannot release so we can embrace others. Your peace defends the weak. Your glory shines in the oppressed. Your justice embraces all people. For this and more, we lift our hearts in gratitude and prayer to you, loving God. Praying as Jesus has taught us, saying, saying Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today is a little different than what it says in the bulletin. <clears throat> I actually go to to verse number 13, and I'm going to be reading from um, Eugene Peterson's The Message. As you were coming in, you might have seen a stack of scriptures on paper, and if you picked one up, you have it in front of you, and if you didn't, you could scoot to get one if you'd like one. This is the story of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. It is a familiar uh, scripture, certainly and so familiar that I like to read it from the message, Eugene Peterson's The Message, as a contemporary translation, just to wake us up a bit. And um, it gives us an opportunity to see it with new eyes. One day when Jesus was playing, praying in a certain place, he might have been playing too, but he was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Master, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So he said, when you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you, forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves, and from the devil, or from evil. Then he said, imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. An old friend traveling through just showed up and I don't have a thing on hand. The friend answers from his bed, don't bother me, the door is locked. My children are all down for the night. I can't get up to give you anything. But let me tell you, even if he won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand your ground, knocking and waking all the neighbors, he will finally get up and get whatever you need. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you will get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse game, a hide and seek game that we're in. If your little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him and give him a live snake on his plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're decent to your own children. And don't you think the Father who conceived you in love will give the Holy Spirit when you ask him? Here ends the reading.
A few weeks ago, I volunteered at Horton Center, our UCC summer camp, located in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, right in the National Forest. I was blessed to work with a staff of people that really loved kids and wanted to find ways for people to find God in nature on that mountain, to meet God in one of the most beautiful places on earth, I think. If you've never been there, you should take a trip to Horton Center. It is just an amazing place. We own the top of Pine Mountain, and it is amazing. It's a New Hampshire treasure to share with others. There is another beautiful UCC camp up in Maine. It's called Pilgrim Lodge. And with, we used to share a working relationship with them before COVID, and I hope that continues now that COVID, well, whatever COVID is going to do. But these two camps are really different. The camp sites are, are, are vastly different. Horton Center sits on top of a mountain. The cabins are spread out in the woods, and there's a center, a center compound. But everywhere you go, there's panoramic views of the White Mountains presidential reigns. We worship from a rock and look out over the White Mountain pre presidential reigns. And it's common to see both bear and moose circle the property on some days where we ring the bell and make everybody go inside. Maine's Pilgrim Lodge Camp is situated on a beautiful lake, much like Lake Winnipesaukee, but not quite as big. And they have cabins that are all neatly lined up in a row, a beautiful beach, and they have the sound of loons singing to them at night. Both of these sites offer youth an opportunity to learn about God and nature, the love of Christ through story, and the power of the Holy Spirit that binds us together through this intentional one week of camp, of faith and fun. I was talking to a staff member while I was there, and she was a person that grew up going to the Pilgrim Lodge camp, but she was on staff at the Horton Center camp. And I said to her, so what do you see is the difference between these two camps? And she was very, very thoughtful. She said, at the lakefront, we experience God in ways that feel very intimate. The sand between our toes, the warmth of the sunshine, the water washing over us as we swim. Here in the mountains, she said, we experience what we cannot touch, grasp, or even understand. These mountains exude power the transcendence of God and the awesome wonder of God. So as I read this week's scripture about prayer, it occurred to me that Jesus is teaching his disciples and us something very similar. We are to pray with boldness to our God who creates and transcends, while at the same time, it is intimate and relational. Jesus models a prayer that's an intimate conversation with an incredibly awesome God. So in today's text, Jesus has been praying again. In the Gospel of Luke, you find Jesus going off by himself to pray often. He does it many times. And the disciple comes up to him and he says, Hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? Kind of like John taught his disciples how to pray. Well, it wasn't that those disciples didn't, didn't know how to pray. They were, grew up, they were Jewish men, they grew up, they knew the Psalms, they knew how to pray, but at that time there were, many, there were a number of people that had disciples that preached around John the Baptist being one, Jesus another, and, maybe, and, and there probably were others. And they often created a prayer that identified their group, that they were followers of that, disciple, of that particular person. Sort of like a 12-step prayer, a 12-step group has the serenity prayer that identifies them and everybody knows that that's the prayer of a 12-step group. I love Eugene Peterson's version of the Lord's Prayer. Rather than our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he simplifies it. He uses the uh, familiar word, father, just as the traditional one does. But he says, father, and I will add mother to make that inclusive. Reveal who you are. 
set the world right. Now this describes the work of the mountaintop God that sees the big picture and longs for justice and righteousness to overcome all that is wrong in the world. Think of climate change and these crazy weather patterns that we're having. Think about war and the destruction that they cause to people and communities and nations and governments and the environment. Think how our planet hurts, how God hurts to see the destruction that we, all God's children, have caused to God's creation communally over the years, not to mention the hatred and the division that is among us. Now we know we have caused this, yet the muck we stand in is so deep, it's hard to find our way. So guide us, God, toward the way of bringing it back to its rightful glory, your kingdom, as you breathe into being. Grab us, enlist us in the work of recreation. Reveal who you are. Shock us so the world sees you. We long for the world to be set right. The prayer then moves into a more personal style with petitions. Keep us alive with three squirrel meals. Keep us forgiven as you for, for, keep us forgiven with you, forgiving others and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and from evil. These words remind us of the basic needs of all people. Everybody needs food, we all need safety, and we all need love. Three square meals, you know that many do not have even one square meal a day, oh God, is that living? If I have three square meals, and you have three square meals, how can we transfer that, plus the dessert and the stuff we put in the freezer, to somebody who needs it? How can I transfer my extras over to those who have less? God, guide us in the ways that protect and offer security to those who are food insecure. Maybe we good stewards of the land, our water, our resources thinking creatively so that all in our interconnected world, your kingdom will have three squares a day. Keep us forgiven and forgiving others. God's love is primed and ready to flow through us every day, 24 hours a day, all day, every day. Yet, our unforgiveness blocks this holy stream from us. All the hurt and pain to which we cling is like a cancer, and the only treatment for it, treatment for it is love. We are to extend love to those who we do not want to love. We are to forgive others even when we don't think they deserve it. Because God wants to participate in our lives intimately and abundantly. And every grudge that remains hurts the person that we hold it against and it hurts ourselves. We are already forgiven. No questions asked, no tests to take. We have been set free a long time ago. Because forgiveness sets us free, we can choose to set each other free from our anger and our grudges. And in doing so, we get set free again and again and again. Yes, God, keep us forgiven and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and from evil. There is evil in the world. And sometimes we ourselves are party to that evil, both individually and communally. This is a communal prayer. Everything is using the word us. We attach evil ourselves to evil when we could be choosing to attach ourselves to you. Certainly in times of 
desolation and consolation. Desolation can come to us unbidden, yet too often times of desolation are created by our own personal choices and intentions from the things we have done and the things we have left undone. Oh God, keep us safe from ourselves and from evil. In the peril that bull that follows the prayer, Jesus charges us to be persistent. Keep asking, seeking, knocking on the door of prayer for what is needed until it drives those you love crazy. And this part of the message can be hard because we all know times when we have asked, sought, and worn out our knuckles knocking and our prayers have not been answered. The judgment then starts to creep into our thinking. Was God listening? Did we not pray hard enough? Did we not use the right words? Why did another person receive an answer and we did not? Why did they receive healing and my loved one did not? What could more could I have done? Sadly, for many, this is a reason to quit praying altogether. Prayer doesn't seem to make a difference. Our family member is still misusing substances. My marriage has ended. Our cancer, my cancer has progressed. Or the job I wanted was given to another applicant. A couple of months ago, I sat right there in that pew where Diane is sitting, and I asked you all to pray for my nephew who had just received a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And I was so hopeful. He lives in Oregon, and it's like the pancreatic cancer capital of research in the United States, and I thought, yes, he's in the right place. He's going to get treatment. Maybe this is going to be something that can be, his life can be prolonged. I was hopeful, but today he is home with his family receiving hospice care. He's 49 years old. He has two kids, 17 and 19. Our prayers for healing were not answered, at least not in the way that we had hoped. Now, I do trust that healing will come for Matt as he leaves this world for a new life in God, and I trust that healing will happen for members of his family, his immediate family, and for our extended family who have all been blessed already by his courage and his strength and his love and his humor, even in the face of death. There's a short line at the end of this passage that we often miss. It says, and don't you think the Father who conceived you in love will give the Holy Spirit when you ask him? The text doesn't offer specific answer to any of our situations, but it does state that we will receive the Holy Spirit. And maybe, maybe this is all we should ever ask for in any situation, that the Holy Spirit will guide our path, give us words, give us strength, celebrate our joy or help us bear our pain. The Spirit will make herself known to us. I'm certain this is what happens on Pine Mountain every summer as youth gather in community, first as strangers, then as friends who go home knowing that something special happened on that mountain. They can't quite name what it is, but they know something special happened, and it will bring them back to the mountain next year. I know the Spirit moved in that staff member who so eloquently just opposed her experience of God at the lake and God on a mountain. The Spirit dabbles, not in worldly details, but in the details of our hearts 
as we work in the world. It teaches us to trust that our God is present in our process, always, even when we don't think God is there. The Spirit touches us individually and in community so that we can learn to trust God and each other. I pray for our congregation. I can say that now. I joined this church a month ago, even though midway through the service my husband went in the emergency room to the hospital, but we joined this church. So this is now my church, so I can say I pray for our congregation as it moves forward in the transition to install a search committee that will search and knock and finally ask a new pastor and teacher to lead this church through another season of life together. I pray that we will feel the power of our awesome, loving God and the presence of the Spirit binding us together. First, the committee that has to work together and then exciting the congregation as we do this holy work together as a body of Christ, unified as one body. Friends, may we all take time each day to be present in prayer. You can use this one if you don't have words of your own. It's a good prayer. Experience the holy. Seeking, asking, knocking. Be astounded by the beauty and the majesty of the mountains that surround us when we look out around Wolfboro and touched by the holy as we swim in our waters, feel the warmth of the sun on our skin, and even the sand between our toes. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray together. Oh, Father who art in heaven, remind us this day that you are not only creation's architect, that you are the babe who cried for food, the teenager who knew loneliness, and the adult who felt the rejection of loved ones. Hallowed be thy name, for yours is the name spun by the stars. Yours is the name whispered by the dying. Yours is the name written on our hearts. Thy kingdom come, may it be a kingdom of peace, not prejudice. May it be a kingdom of sharing, not grasping, a kingdom of hope, not hurting. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your word be more than a print on a page. May your justice be more than a wish in our hearts. May your will become our deepest desire. Give us this day our daily bread and let us taste it in the kisses of our loved ones, in the splashes of our kids jumping off the dock. Let it fill us in the empty moments of our lives. Let it slip out of our hands to mend the brokenness of our world. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. May those who have hurt us find a welcome in our hearts, even as we have found our home in yours. Turn our hearts <clears throat> from the seductions of our world and the simple pleasures that turn us from you. Keep us from thinking we are so important that we ignore those around us. Help us always bring others to you in prayer before we bring ourselves, as we do in these moments. We pray, play, pray for the Moffats. That they continue, that healing continues. We pray for my nephew Matt and for their family as they wait with him and get as many days as they can together. Deliver us from evil. 
not just the great evils of war and hunger, but from ingratitude, self-love, pride, and all those little evils that do such great harm. For thine is the kingdom, our heart's true longing, and the power which you set aside to serve us in weakness, and the glory which would mirror in our lives, our bodies, our minds, our souls, this day and every day, forever and ever. Amen. As we wait for the coming of God's good reign, we answer the invitation to do God's good work, bringing our tithes and offerings with joyful gratitude. May we now receive these gifts.
now in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people, men, women, children, people of other cultures, people of other faith traditions, all people. Love and serve our God and rejoice in the great power of the Holy Spirit that binds us all together as one body. And now may Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.